a warm welcome to all of you. My name is Christine Steenberg. I'm an associate professor in English literature at the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. Together with my colleagues Petra van Dam, Katja Kwastek, Sjoerd Kluiving, and a group of very enthusiastic students, I founded the Environmental Humanities Center in the winter of 2016, almost five years ago. Our online series Entanglements brings together speakers and audiences across time zones and disciplines with relatively low CO2 emissions. The title uh, of the series, of course, refers to the entanglements so central to the field of environmental humanities, as well as to the entanglement between academic research, artistic practice, and activism, and to the way we are all entangled here in this online community coming together around a mulberry tree. For tonight, we are very excited to welcome Professor Kate Sandilands into our series. She is professor in the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York University, Canada, and her work sits at the intersections of queer and feminist theory, biopolitics, environmental literature, and multi-species studies, especially critical plant studies. Tonight, she will speak to us about Mulberry's a political love story. When we asked our audience members why they are attending your lecture tonight, Kate, they, uh, they wrote about how inspiring your work is and how pivotal you have been to their research. They cherish your attending to the intersections between queer feminist sense-making and plant-human relations, and are really interested in the way you connect your personal experiences to the academic world, as well as connecting people to the lives and worlds of plants. Some audience members wrote that not only do they love your work, they also love mulberries, and even told us that mulberry trees live in their gardens. As one of them put it, we're hoping to learn a lot from you and from the mulberries. Before I hand over to you, however, there are two practicalities that I would like to share with the audience. Firstly, we are recording this lecture, but only for the private use of people who let us know that, they, oh, I wrote this down and then <laughs> we, we decided that we might also post it on YouTube. Um, but uh, we record the speaker view only. So you as audience members will not be in the video unless you speak. And secondly, Professor Sanderlands will speak about for about 40 minutes with a break in the middle for some gentle stretching and a few questions. And you may pose your questions via the chat, either in the break or after the talk. And if you wish to post your question already during the talk, if you have a question that you don't want to forget, then please post it only to me uh, and not to everyone so that we're not distracted during the talk. Um, and you can do that by choosing Christine Steinberg instead of everyone in the chat options. Um, so I look forward to that discussion with you. But first, I want to invite you to join me in welcoming Professor Sandy Lanz into our online community with a Zoom applause. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, are we all seeing mulberries? Excellent. Uh, first of all, my great thanks to, uh, to Christine and her colleagues uh, at the Environmental Humanities Center. I am honored to be part of the Entanglement series at Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. Um, thank you very much for your attention, particularly um, in, in the evening, uh, where I understand it is eight o'clock. Um, I am currently on the west coast of North America, um, where it is uh, 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, however, this particular story um, that I'm going to tell you is very much located in, uh, in Ontario, in Toronto, the city of Toronto, Ontario. Uh, like most of my work, it is very deeply place-based. Uh, in honor of the fact that today is Canada's uh, newly, declared, uh, newly declared National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, I would like to begin the talk with a land acknowledgement that is located in the city of Toronto. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that the land uh, on which this essay was written and about which it is written um, 
is the traditional and ongoing territory of many First Nations, including the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. Toronto, Tokoronto is currently home to um, many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. And I am grateful to be able to live and write and take responsibility for that territory. Until 2017, I never gave mulberries much thought. This situation is unusual as I have been living intimately, thinking and writing with plants for a long time. If asked, I would have been able to hum, hum the tune of, here we go round the mulberry bush, but I had never knowingly tasted a mulberry fruit and certainly would not have said we were on close terms. Although a mulberry tree of some size inhabits the street facing part of my front yard, I also had no real idea that I co cohabited my West Toronto neighborhood with rather a lot of its relatives. Sorry, I just forgot to put on my stopwatch and I'm going to do it now. From a starting point of relative mulberry blindness, that year I learned to pay attention to mulberry trees in two ways, more or less at the same time. In the first, I reread Jeffrey Eugenides' novel, Middlesex, for a panel at the 2017 Association for the Study of Literature and Environment Conference, ASLI, in Detroit, Michigan. I was looking for the plants in Middlesex, which is mostly set in Detroit, and there are mulberries all over it, both the novel and the city. In Middlesex, they are a major dramatic motif and their presence tendrils through the novel stories of sex, gender, class, migration, racism, and incest, to name a few. In the second, I took a field naturalist course in Toronto's High Park. There are mulberries all over it too. As the course leader outlined, these trees are also part of a drama in which one kind of mulberry, Morris Alba or white mulberry, is considered exotic and invasive threatening the integrity of another kind of mulberry, Morris rubra or red mulberry, to the point that the latter is listed as endangered under the Ontario Endangered Species Act. In High Park, we spent a lot of time learning how to distinguish between these two species. Fuzziness of the, of the leaves is a major indicator. You have to get pretty up close and intimate with a mulberry in order to identify it. So, it, and it seemed that almost all of the ones that we identified were hybrids like the one in the picture. Especially with all this drama going on, I started to pay a lot more attention to mulberries. In fact, I fell completely in love with them. I learned to recognize their coyly variable leaf shapes, it's called heterophyly in case you're interested, and suddenly saw them everywhere, intensely pruned small weeping varieties presiding over neat circular beds in highly manicured lawns, Beautiful large trees shading the streets of older neighborhoods, often announcing their presence with extensive purple stains on the sidewalk. Scraggly shrubs thriving at the edges of parks and especially in Detroit, growing in glorious entrepreneurial profusion in now vacant lots. I sought out berries on local trees where there were many and in local shops where there were none except dried ones. I sought them out in literary worlds beyond Middlesex where they take many forms. In Ovid's Metamorphoses, the ill-starred lovers Pyramus and Thisbe arrange to meet under a mulberry tree, as Thisbe, and Thisbe's dying act is to curse its white fruit and to turn the red of their blood. In Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, they reappear via Quince's prologue in the play within a play, Pyramus and Thisbe. They also make their way into Coriolanus, where they are humble because delicate to handle. The image idiom of blue sea turned into mulberry fields recurs in Chinese literature, e.g. in Ge Hong's third century Shen Zhan Zhuan, as an indication of epochal change. 1500 years later, Walt Whitman, also writing about change, includes a mulberry tree in his poem, This Compost, in Leaves of Grass, which is a meditation on the nature of life and soul as an endless recycling of everyday matters and energies, including mulberry ones. And in Hisham Matar's Booker nominated In the Country of Men, there is this gorgeous fragment from protagonist Suleiman remembering his nine-year-old self in Tripoli. 
I decided that mulberries were the best fruit God had created, and I began to imagine young, lively angels conspiring to plant a crop in the earth's soil after they heard that Adam, peace and blessings be upon him, and Eve, peace and blessings be upon her, were being sent down to here to earth as punishment. God knew, of course, he's the all-knowing, but he liked the idea and so let the angels carry out their plan. I plucked one off and it almost melted in my fingers. I threw it in my mouth and it dissolved, the small balls exploding like fireworks. I ate another and another and another. Another and another and another. As I grew and savored my intimacy with mulberries, both local and literary, bloody, humble, sensuous, representative of life, change, and love, it became increasingly clear to me that mulberry relationships are often very intimate. They are intimate in their bursting luscious sweetness, in their association with blood, and in, ter in their multiple and in ongoing involvements in economies of domestication. Most ob obviously, of course, mulberries are intimately involved in the millennia-old industry of sericulture, in which they are the primary food source of the silkworm Bombyx mori. Especially in sericulture, we see that these intimacies are not always sites of pleasure. For the domesticated silkworm, intimacy with mulberries and silk harvesting humans not only leads to untimely death, the cocoons are generally boiled alive to clean and extract the finest silk thread, but has also, through thousands of years of selective, um, sorry, of selective breeding, rendered the adult moth incapable of flight and perversely insensitive to the morous smell of the leaves on which it must lay its eggs. For the white mulberry, however, the worm's favorite food, this intimacy has largely been responsible for the species' global distribution, from its origins in China to its now ubiquity on all continents except Antarctica. As Peter Coles documents in his sumptuous plant biography, Mulberry, the globalization of sericulture and moriculture has been extensively bound up in imperialism, war, religious conflict, and colonialism. Both cultures have also supported artisanal as well as industrial forms of cultivation and production and have extensively involved women's and children's labor, both historically and in the present, including everything from empowering female entrepreneurship to institutionalizing child slavery. It is now not uncommon to speak of plant-human intimacies as sites of multi-species inquiry. Julie Soleil Archambault's ethnography of gardeners in, in, in Hambane, Mozambique, for example, suggests that such intimacies can embody transformative potential of everyday engagement with the material world in opposition to neoliberal capitalist abstractions and the related commodification of intimacy. I have especially given the ways in which my morophilic and other plant intimacies have shaped and enriched my inhabitation of Toronto a great deal of sympathy for this argument. As Lauren Berlant, Kim Talbert, and other feminist thinkers have emphasized in different ways, however, intimacies are also sites of regulation. Who is allowed to be, forced to be, and or prohibited from being intimate with whom and how is a significant modality of biopolitical organization in settler capitalist societies. And these operations of biopower clearly include plant and other multi-species actors. To practice restorative kinship with plants and others, as Robin Wall Kimmerer, Deborah, Deborah Bird Rose, and Donna Haraway all suggest, suggest we do urgently, thus must involve not only an embrace of plant loving in general, but also a thoughtful questioning of the different kinds of intimacies in which we are bound up with plants and a careful exploration of other perhaps more just and life enriching intimate possibilities that may emerge in the process of inquiry. In this presentation, I will attempt some of this work of thoughtful questioning by focusing on mulberries and specifically on the biopolitics of mulberry human relations in Southern Ontario and on possibilities for their eth ethically sensuous reorientation in current conditions of intimate complexity. In the longer work on which this presentation is based, I tell two stories. The first is a consideration of the biopolitical organization of mulberry species identity, which is the central axis of the invasion drama involving Morris Albra and Morris Rubra. In this story, 
the reduction of plants to their genomic identities is part of the larger policing of purity that is central to the racist logic of settler colonization that privileges the idea of a stable and humanless nature to be defended from change and that prevents us from considering possibilities for Morris Alba intimacy outside their involvement in colonialism and invasiveness. The second story is a consideration of the everyday and systemic regulation of Mulberry sexual expression, which is linked to questions of utility, to a colonial distrust of fecundity, ferality, unpredictability, and excess, and to the spatial and aesthetic impoverishment of multi-species intimacies in communities uh, in, and communities in cities like Toronto. Uh, this paper will appear in, uh, in this publication, Ecologies of Gender, Contemporary Nature Relations and the Non-Human Turn, which will be out next year, edited by Suzanne Latal and Sabine Nessel. Uh, because of the time limitations, I'm only going to focus on the first of these two stories, but I would be absolutely delighted to talk about queer mulberry sex in the question and answer that follows. Red mulberry is native to North America, where it is found throughout the central and eastern parts of the continent, especially in the southeast. Like all mulberries, Morris rubra is a deciduous, fruit-bearing tree that grows quickly while young. It can reach a height of 65 feet and often lives 125 years, so it's medium-sized and not very old in tree terms. Given its widespread distribution, sometimes dense population, and prolific fruit production, it's not surprising that Morris rubra, also, please forgive me if there are native speakers of any of these languages, um, I am not going to do a particularly good job with pronunciation, but I consider it my responsibility to at least try. Sachisagona Ochia, Onondaga, Oakatim Inchi, Delaware, Metakwa Palwa, Shawnee, Bihi, Choctaw, K, Muskoka Cree, and Kua, Cherokee, among other names. The fruit plays a major role in the culinary, medicinal, and technological worlds of many indigenous nations on the eastern side of the continent. Indeed, in the southeast, several nations celebrate a whole mulberry month. For example, Bihi Fishi in Choctaw and Kisfi in Muskoka, both roughly in May out of respect for gratitude and gratitude for their abundance. The fruit, carefully cultivated by some nations for millennia, can be eaten fresh, dried, made into jam or jelly, and mashed into a variety of forms of cake, and then reconstituted and cooked into a highly nutritious sauce for late winter days, high in vitamin C, iron, K1, potassium, and antioxidants. Small branches of red mulberry trees are pliable and can be made into bows and baskets. Older wood is light, sturdy, and good for construction. Inner bark can be used to make cloth without the intermediary of silkworms. And many parts of the tree create excellent dyes with colors depending on whether the roots, branches, bark, or berries are used. Different parts of the tree also contain bioactive compounds and many nations have ongoing traditions of mulberry medicinal, medicinal use as a laxative, emetic, cathartic, tonic, and, and sorry, I can never pronounce this, anthelmintic and or hallucinogenic, and as a treatment for urinary problems, dysentery, and ringworm. Morris rubra is at the far northern reach of its uh, habitat in the Carolinian forests of southern Ontario, which stretch southeast from what is now Toronto to Lake Erie and beyond southward. In Ojibwemowin, Mulberries, mulberries are mitigwabinin, and in Mohawk, they are shahaksiowa. In both nations, mulberries recede in importance relative to other berries, such as strawberries, blueberries, and bearberries, which are far more pre prevalent in these northern territories. They are, however, important enough to have names. White mulberry is, of course, a relative newcomer. To North America, but it has been globally, a globally cosmopolitan spe species for far longer. As Coles documents extensively, Morris alba is originally from East Asia, where it has been the stuff of legend for thousands of years and was carried along the so-called Silk Road, slightly behind the moths, from China to Japan, India, the Middle East, Europe, and North Africa, 
where it met communities of Black Mulberry or Morris Negra and beyond. Um, uh, Marjolaine, if you are, uh, if your mulberry is growing in California, it is almost certainly a Black mulberry hybrid, so not part of the invasion drama story that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, although less prized than that of Morris Negra, the fruit of Morris Alba can be easily moved, dried, and stored. Perhaps more importantly, its leaves are the preferred food source of dramatic, uh, preferred of silkworms even relative to other mulberry species. And so the trees have followed sericultural desires in their anthropogenic world travels rather than culinary, nutritional, medical, or aesthetic ones. Such silk aspirations brought Morris Alba to North America. Although European explorer colonizers noted extensive, often carefully cultivated Morris rubber groves in what are now South Carolina and Georgia in the 16th century, White mulberries were brought to the American colonies at about the same time, with the specific intent of promoting a domestic silk industry. For example, the 1620, in 1624, the legislature, legislature of Virginia required every white property-owning male to, to plant at least four white mulberry trees for precisely this purpose. And Benjamin Franklin, in the later 18th century, was instrumental in planting Morris Alba in cities like Philadelphia in order to make individual small holdings more, in, more economically self-sufficient. He wrote in a letter, mulberry trees may be planted in hedgerows or walks or avenues or for shade near a house where nothing else is wont to grow. The commercial mulberry mania that followed did not result in a lasting history, at least partly because of a mulberry blight that decimated the planted trees and dashed settler colonial sericultural hopes in the late 19th century. However, white mulberry trees remain a fixture of North American cities and towns, and in the names of hundreds of mulberry streets, whether or not there are actually any mulberries living on them. As noted earlier, Morris alba is in North America considered an invasive species, and this phenomenon has reached the most alarmist attention in southern Ontario, where Morris rubra has been listed as an endangered species, partly because of Morris alba incursions and partly because of dramatic changes to Morris rubra's preferred habitat. Morris alba is much less fussy. Although this scenario is hardly unique, the North American Morris story is complicated by Morris Alba's sociability, as Coles puts it. Unlike its Morris Negra cousin, white mulberry is strongly inclined to interbreed with red mulberry, resulting in multiple hybrids wherever it meets them. This, and not habitat competition, is the primary reason why Morris Alba is considered invasive in southern Ontario. The species is increasingly mixing with Morris rubra. As the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources notes, there are fewer than 300 red mulberries remaining in Ontario, and the greatest threat to red mulberry is crossbreeding with the non-native white mulberry. To spell out a key difference, it is not that individual red mulberry plants are suffering because of Morris alba. In fact, they are thriving together as hybrids. It is that the purity of the native red mulberry population is called into question by its hybridization. Red mulberries are, in other words, endangered an endangered species because the white ones are mixing with them, not endangered organisms. Despite the fact that Morris rubra, rubra alba hybrids are likely increasing their northern range and abundance along with urbanization and development, which Morris Alba enjoys and Morris Rubra on its own clearly doesn't, red mulberries are thus at risk and white mulberries are reviled for the, their reproductive promiscuity. In the interests of, uh, this is actually a, a good moment to have a little bit of a break. Uh, I'll continue the story and I believe we're going to break, have, have a little stretch for a couple of minutes and then there's time for a couple of questions and then I will continue. <laughs> 